여러분 안녕하세요. 저는 구글 플레이 개발 사업 개발의 김고은입니다. Wait a minute. Our audience probably can only speak English, right? They're not on YouTube. Uh, not like the YouTube guys who okay. can turn on auto translate. So okay. let's switch to English, right? Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good morning. So my name is Ko Kim. I'm part of the Google Play business development team here in Mountain View, focusing games. So I'm Yoshi, uh, based in Tokyo. I'm doing the uh, Google Play's apps and the games. Today we're here to talk to you about how to go global with Google Play. As you've known from yesterday's many various announcements, Google Play is a really, really big marketplace. And so we're here to, this morning we're here to talk to you about how to kind of take advantage of that, but what are some of the best practices and tips to go to a lot of those foreign markets. So let's talk about, let's just get a general idea. So how many of you have come here from outside the US? Wow, that's a lot of you. Oh. Asia? <laughs> Europe, cool. South America, oh. Brazil. Really? Why are Why are you here to begin with? The world's biggest sporting event is happening right in Brazil <laughs> right now. Um, I just came from there, yeah, so I don't even know why I'm here. Yeah. So, but that's just that's that's amazing. Thank you for being here today. I'm really excited to have you here. So let's just take a look at what the current world of Google Play looks like right now. Those marked in green, um, you know, Google Play, people all over the world from 190 countries download and install apps on Google Play every single day. Um, those marked in green are actually some of our largest markets, not only by install base, but also by revenue. And what's really cool is that it's not just the U.S. I mean, there's markets all over the world, for many of you probably in the countries that you've come from. And then we'll also talk about a little bit later what some of our fastest growing markets are. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of some of the top, like most popular games in the U.S. on Google Play today. And developers from all over the world are actually finding success. Um, those marked in, bl in blue are obviously companies that are based outside the U.S., in Europe, actually. And in Asia, the Asian companies are also marked in red. So that's at least a third of these, like, a third of these titles have come from developers outside the U.S. So what does it take to kind of expand your business outside of your domestic market into, into the U.S. or into some other markets today? All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's back to the, my home country, Japan. So, so first of all, so uh, you go to go the global or go to the, some such, uh, the specific the countries. So first of all, need to uh, know the users. What's the users' behaviors? So uh, this is the... Uh, my uh, countries, the Tokyo, from the uh, from this outside of the Tokyo to the commute uh, to the central Tokyo. So uh, in the trains, in during the people's commuting, uh, people, what are they doing? Is look at the their their hands. They're touching the smartphones, and probably they playing the games, or probably they're messaging in their phones. So the. Uh, Understanding the users is the pretty important things as fast of all. So, Yoshi, what's the average time a um, someone in Japan spends commuting each day? So, uh, average commute time is like 60 minutes, only one way in the trains. Probably the same as the, the mountain from here, city to the mountain view, right? Yeah, that's about you, it. You, you have a commute. Well, yes, I do have to commute. Sometimes it's an hour and a half, right. but I'm driving, right? <laughs> so I can't yeah. necessarily drive and play games at the same time. That probably so, wouldn't work out too well. So. Totally, totally different. The, uh, in here, is commute is drive or by car, but in Asia, it's taking the trains in a commute. That's so, a totally different, and the user uses is different, too. Yeah, so think about it, two hours a day, five days a week, that's 10 hours a week, yeah. times a month, that's 40 hours. It's a lot of game time just in a train. So right. so let's take a look at some of the most popular games in my market. Mm -hmm. um, Yoshi, you want to talk a little bit about what yes. we see in Korea and Japan? So uh, in the Asia, the Korea's game is a uh, pretty popular game is the casual games. So cute, the animal titles, and the casual, super casual games. And then several times, uh, the people tending to play in the, some people's tending to play in the hardcore games. And in Japan, uh, it's more like uh, some game system combined, like casual game plus casual game plus monetization systems. We call like meet casual games in Japan. 
How about the Western countries? Some of the Western countries. So in the U.S., it's pretty well diversified. I mean, people will play a wide variety of games mm -hmm. from casual match three all the way to like some of the more strategy simulation. Um, some of the, like the farm sim building games and a lot of that stuff. But if you look in Europe, let's, especially let's say in Germany and Russia, mm -hmm. where some of our biggest markets are, it's a little bit more interesting. You're, like you definitely see more of that military, that uh, medieval esque, really hardcore themes that are coming around. Like in Germany, they're really all about that medieval fantasy, like middle, med medieval fantasy themed games. A lot of deep strategy that's involved, um, which is pretty apparent. And then also they love their football simulation games. I've never seen so many football simulation games in your life. Football soccer depending on how you want to, like. which country in the world you're from. But if you look in Russia, they really like their tank <laughs> games and their army games and things. But that's, but yeah, that's what's really high. interesting. It's like, you know, if you look at a lot of these games, the same gameplay elements um, pretty much resonate across the board. You have a lot of RPG elements, a lot of, let's say, building characters, going on adventures. Like, a lot of those themes are the same. It's just the way that they present it is a little bit different. So... Now that you have an idea of what types of games are popular in each of these markets, and especially around the, war in the world, do you have a game that you think that can be successful? And if so, like how, what do you need to change, whether it's how do you present that game to your audience or do some changes so you can be successful mm -hmm. for all of those markets? It's really just pretty simple. We kind of break it down to three things. Um, it's like, first, it's really about, first is how do you acquire those users to begin with? How do you convince them, hey, you need to install my game because it's awesome? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the second is how do you connect that, connect with that user when they first get into the game? What is that onboarding experience like? How do you get them kind of hooked to begin with? And then finally, it's like, how do you get those players to come back? Like, how do you retain those players beyond the first week, but actually turn them into a lifetime player? So let's start with the first one. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of an image of what a, the Google Play Store looks like today on device and also on the desktop web. Um, what are some of the things that you notice, the first thing that a user is going to see? Well, it's clearly the icons, right? So let's take a look at some of the different icons by market. Um, do you notice some slight differences from like just from looking at the US and versus like let's say Asia specifically? Well, in the US, you actually see a lot more realistic character designs. Um, and also like a mix of like, you know, there's male characters, there's also like monster characters. So they don't really kind of latch onto a different thing. And then if you look in Korea, for example, it's actually a lot cuter. You see that more anime, manga, visual style elements. Um, and so they really focus on cute characters. Unless you're a sports game, that's probably a little weird if you focused on that. But, but Yoshi, what is it like in the rest of the, in the rest of Asia? So, uh, in Japan, obviously the dragon is pretty famous in there. So I uh, put the dragons in the icons is pretty popular right now and top revenue grossing chart. And also the uh, one more uh, trend in Japan is the uh, some cute cat is in the icons. It's also the pretty popular in Japan too. And also the Taiwan as well as the Hong Kong is the uh, Three Kingdom story is po pretty popular t theme in there. That's pretty popular. A lot of Three Kingdoms, right? Yeah. Everyone likes cats all over the world. It's just whether it looks like yeah, a real cat or a or a cartoon cat, right? Yeah, so. in the Japan it's pretty you know, everyone's using the cat for their games, mm -hmm. beamers. <laughs> all right. Uh so uh the, so we just uh we just talking about the icons. Then user after you see the icons, what the user will see is the your game titles. So this is an example of the uh, Clash of Clans and the Candy Crush, how to get into the Japan market is. So, uh, the, so uh, the original game's name is Clash of Clans in the English versions. Then they changed to the Japanese version is the, they make in the Japanese name of the Clash of Clans plus their original names. That's that what the Supercell did. And also the Candy Crush saga is more uh, tremendous changing in the Japan market. And then they, uh, they changed the title name is the uh, only Japanese. And also they took off the saga from the, their titles for the Japanese market because the saga is pretty, uh, n doesn't make sense in the Japanese. So they took the saga. Then they called it Candy Crush in Japanese only. That's what they said. So right now is the uh, title is pretty important. Uh, after the icons. 
So after the players take a look at the icons and the titles, um, the next shot. things are definitely is a screenshot, right? If you think about the Google Play Store <coughs> listing, that's kind of the next thing they're going to kind of look at. So this is an example of a game um, in the U.S. of like what screenshots look like to a U.S. player. Um, visual style is a little bit different um, in the West. It's definitely more focused on the gameplay. It's really simple. Um, it kind of shows, it gives you, it gives a player a better idea what the game in-game experience is going to look like, or what the inside the application is going to look like. But Meanwhile, in Japan, here you go. Well, it's totally different from the Western titles. It's uh, the Asian title is screenshot is using more like bright and many uh, the characters text and try to make it more like not only the game scenes, only also the they are providing the more what the user can uh, play in the world of the games. That's the important thing in Asia. And also, the, in the Google Play, you can change the uh, screenshot, also the icons, and uh, you can change in the, for the each country. So you provide the, uh, probably the tweak those uh, screenshots for the Asian market as well as the US market. Mm -hmm. right, let's go. So now you got an idea Next. of how to create like, the best store listing for your game in order to get those users to install those games. Now that you got them to install your game, which is awesome, let's go to the next step is how do you get them kind of hooked onto your game to begin with. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, like, well, even before we even get to the game, let's just talk about mobile networks, right? It's really under important to understand each of your local markets, but especially what their mobile in infrastructure is looks looking like. This is an example of me. I downloaded a game. It's called Ace Fishing um, from Comp2S. And it's actually a pretty good fishing game. But some of these games actually just requires a constant network connection. So you can imagine when I was in Brazil, um, sometimes with all that many people, the connection can be somewhat unreliable. Um, I get a kind of this notice that says, hey, like we don't see that your game, that your device is connected to a network, um, so we are not going to let you play the game at all. So can, you can imagine like a user for the first time, if they had no idea that you need a constant network connection to, in order to play the game, you can tell it's probably not going to be a great user experience. And so um, we definitely encourage you to do like wait, either one of two things. First, definitely note in your description on your mm -hmm. Google Play Store listing if your game does require a network connection in order to actually play the game. And then second, um, if you do, if if you have like a constantly connected network game, like one of the things you may want to consider is an offline mode or another game mode or an app mode so that a user can still kind of do things within the game. But as soon as they get to an actually connected, actually connect to a network, then mm -hmm. they can start continuing that game experience. Why? Right. So, so, but let's talk about what UI and navigation UI. looks like. Yes, uh, this is the pretty popular games in Japan, and the, uh, I would like to explain about the UI stuff in the what's the popular in the Japan market is. Uh, so this is the uh, those two titles, Puzzle and Dragons and the Monster Strike, uh, which is the uh, number one and number three in the top gross revenue ranking in Japan, and the. Uh, is the important things is as uh, we so as I explained before, the uh, Japan has the commute uh, the commute cultures, and also the so basically the those game is uh, the plans and making for the these commute trains uh, cultures, which is more portlet mode, and so as possible they uh, plan the portlet mode for the game and. The, also, they, they put the many information as much as possible in the one screen, but the, it's pretty complicated, the, uh, the navigation, uh, complicated information in the one screen, but the user is pretty easy to navigate in the one screen. For example, the one thumb uh, fingers, then user can do whatever they want in the one screen. That's the important things in Japan. How do you think, how, how about the next, the uh, American styles? The American Western style? Western style. American style, um, you can see like a lot of games actually have a landscape mode, um, mostly because that's just how, you know, it looks prettier. Mm -hmm. Most people are used to landscape mode if you think about like how people have played games or interacted with applications to begin with. Mostly it was on TV or desktop screen, so that's clearly landscape mode. But if you look at a lot of the navigation and UI elements, they definitely take kind of a back seat towards um, 
kind of like within the gameplay experience, a lot simpler, a um, lot cleaner um, UI look. Um, if you want to access certain other game trees or profiles, you actually have to go to that profile and it opens up another screen. Rather than, let's say, in some of the Asian games, um, you can quickly go to different parts of different modes, different sections of the game, with just kind of like all in one screen. So it's a little bit different. Um, it's just like it's just that's just how like, if you think about gameplay times, it makes sense. People prefer the simple and more cleaner looks. Mm -hmm. But let's also talk about like in-game um, localization. So this is, we're going to go to an app. We're going to take a break and go to an app. So um, I do understand you guys are here. If you're big um, soccer or football fans, I know there's the U.S.-Germany <laughs> match going on. So I actually, before I went to Brazil, um, I actually used Duolingo to kind of learn a little bit of Brazilian Portuguese so that I wouldn't be completely lost in that country trying to find my way to that stadium. Um, and so what was really interesting is that Duolingo kind of like, you know, they def it's a foreign language learning app. And what they did is that they kind of made it a very consistent experience, but they made sure when they localized in-game for not only a U.S. user, but also a German user, that they're using the right words, the right font style, and everything consistent across the board. So any U.S. or German can actually learn some Brazilian Portuguese before heading to the, heading to the matches. <clears throat> So what's really cool about Google Play is like in the developer console, it actually does provide some localization tools for you to get started. Um, you can get professional translations directly through the APK translation service that's found in the developer console. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, you can also use the translator toolkit to upload your strings as XMS files, XML files, and a translation engine can actually create localized versions of that file. So we do provide a lot of tools in order for you to get started in localizing a lot of those markets. And you know, clearly you can see I can either be a U.S. or German and then learn Brazilian <laughs> Portuguese. So, next so slide. In the, in the Asia, is the uh, line break is pretty popular, uh, pretty important in the, uh, the Asian market. So, uh, this is the example of the uh, line break is click versions and the in click versions. So, our uh, the uh, above one is the in Japanese is Hajime Mashite Watashi no Namae wa Blake Line Line Blake and Kimu this. This is a clip version. And right side is how to look like from the user perspective is nice to meet you. My Line Blake name is Kim. It's pretty you know natural in the uh, above side. But the incorrect version is Hajime Mashite Watashi no na Line Blake Mae wa Kimu this. This is, looks like, nice to meet you, my ne, line break, Ms. Kim. So uh, from the user perspective, this is uh, the unnat using the unnatural the uh, Japanese or unnatural Asian languages, is the uh, user feel like, OK, this game is not, uh, not customized for, uh, for my countries, for my uh, languages. Then uh, user easy to leave that the uh, games. So the retention is the uh, using the uh, light uh, line break is in the game is pretty popular, pretty important things. But this is <clears throat> this also applies to the West as well, um, vice versa. So if you think about, like, especially if you're trying to think about your navigation buttons and your menu buttons, mm -hmm. like. Asian languages are a lot more condensed language format versus, let's say, a Western language that can take a lot of room. So you want to be aware of like what your menus look like, um, what your buttons look like, um, and then just the amount of text that shows up within the screen. Because the last thing you want is text to kind of run over um, the button. It would kind of look really weird, regardless of whether you're from Asia or the US. So we, we recommended the check in. So after you finish the translation localizations, then uh, check in in the you know ask to the your nat the local language the native speakers and then check in the yeah. it looks like a native or not. Yeah. All right. Fun part. Fun part. Let's talk about how you actually retain and make money, right? So. All right. So our uh, here. Do you know the gotcha system in here? Gotcha. Gotcha. Anyone? Uh, okay, I hope. So I'd like to show the how to gotcha work in the game. In so you're going to turn on the demo? Yep, I'd like to do the demo. So in the Asia games, especially in the Japan games, so are uh, the... Oops. You're going to show everyone your password. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'd like to show the uh, Puzzle and Dragons demo in here. And uh, I'd like to show the how to work the gotcha in the games 
So gacha is the, hard, the uh, get the chance to get these strong items or strong characters in the games. No, they guarantee to get the uh, items in the games. That's the uh, different part. Let's get started. So in other words, it's a lottery. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many of you are familiar with Puzzles and Dragons? Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I, so just explaining for those that are not aware of Puzzle and Dragons, it's a you know it's developed by a Japanese developer, Gung Ho. Um, it's a match three RPG game. Um, that thing. So Yoshi is going to show you kind of one of the common gameplay, common mechanics that we use to get users to kind of hooked into this game. Mm -hmm. um, you you kind of fight monsters through dungeons. You collect them and you build them up. In order to get new monsters, you kind of have to go to this uh, dragon. That offers something. So we have we have so gift cards. I have a gift card here for this uh, doing the discoucher. Because we want some. Because in order to progress through the dungeon, it's actually a lot easier to Dun. have more powerful, it's powerful over. eggs. Uh, what is this one? Uh, it's the, How do you like it? No? Uh, not good enough? Not good it's enough. not good enough for him. So we're going to try again. <laughs> so. Try again. So this is a special collaboration with the Japanese famous anime in here. Eh, Subarus. That's still not good enough for you? It's, I think it's not enough. Let me try one more. He has very high standards for what types of monsters he wants. <laughs> I want to go with the eggs. Let's try. Silver. Nope, it's another silver. I don't think you're going to get it. The Let's same try again. doctors. One more? One okay. more. One more? All right. <laughs> one more. I think feels like He's... I, I can't get the gold. Are you feeling Actors. lucky? Here we yeah. go. Here you go. I don't oh. think. Oh. I don't think it's happening Same. for you. One more? One more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one more. This is the last chance, hopefully. Are you sure you have enough credit in your account to do this? Uh, yes. This is the last. Last chance. All right. Here we go. So, silver. I don't think it's your day. <laughs> okay. 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 How much money did you just spend? 25 bucks. <laughs> in the three minutes. In three minutes. <laughs> I wish I could make that return in three minutes. Anyway, yeah. anyway that's the uh, gacha system in Japan. So our, it's not only our, this kind of the gacha system, is it? Only in the, this system in Japan, but the, uh, the popular games is uh, making the, this systems to uh, making the monetizations, and then they tweak the uh, game balance uh, with the, uh, what character is uh, in the games. So they, they making the characters, when they making the characters, then uh, they thinking about the how to uh, affect the, those characters is in the games. So what about, what about in the West? So in the West, it's a little bit different. Um, Free-to-play mechanics um, are, you know, they, the ghost games kind of more focus on gradual learning curves. So I remember when I first played Puzzle and Dragon, within five minutes they were telling me, this is how, this is the, this is the dungeon system, this is the how do you get match threes. Also, if you want to get better combos, mm -hmm. you have to do this. And like, you know, they kind of smash everything in within the first like three dungeons, which is like supposed to be five to 10 minutes. So whereas in the West, a lot of the games, especially for a lot of these freemium games, they kind of introduce these new uh, features and game modes very uh, piecemeal. They'll go, it's more gradual learning curves. They want you to kind of like experience like, okay, get an idea once you understand, oh, match three things. Oh, if you match multiple, then you get a combo and so it's a different like mm -hmm. learning curve in a lot of those games in the west and also like a lot of these common gameplay mechanics that you see and especially what they monetize is not necessarily based on the lottery system well there's some basis on the lottery system but the focus is mostly more on building um, of building items and characters and like buildings of permanent value and so this is actually a screenshot of tiny dice dungeon from congregate um, they focus that one of their kind of best uh, monetized mechanics is actually building new dice. So this game is all about like you get better dice in order to get better attack rates. So it's sort of like a lottery, but 
not really. Um, but <laughs> what's interesting is that you can build better dice so that you have higher chances of, let's say, a certain um, elemental damage attack or higher critical damage and a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But in order to get those dice, you have to kind of put in more money to like get like these different shards in order to create those more powerful dice. And so this is actually what a lot of premium currency is focused on, and especially the monetization law the, among Western players, because they want to give these players something that they can keep versus a chance of getting something that could be valuable. Yep. So two totally different things. Oh, wait. Next. Last thing, uh, prices. And so we really want to emphasize doing your research on prices. Um, people, if you look at, this is a difference between dollars and euros, and I think even in Europe, they don't use a lot of nines anyway, but especially in the US, a lot of prices ends with nines. Don't know why, there's, there's a pricing study on this if you're really curious on why this is. But, um, but if you look in Korea and Asia, everything ends with zeros. So that's something you wanna check because if you have a price that ends with a nine or even any other digit, it's gonna look really strange to any player or any user that's trying to purchase any items. Mm -hmm. They're gonna think something's wrong with the game and so they're not gonna end up purchasing to be in with. So what's great about the developer console is that we do have a currency conversion tool. You can input your kind of main, whatever your primary currency is, and then you can see how that will convert in each and every currency where we actually sell into that market. And so you can modify in a lot of that for each market as you want, but these are just some of the tools that we have available in order to make sure that your game or your application is locally relevant to that user. Yeah, for the, in the main, uh, your main countries, uh, you should make sure they uh, manually put the price range in the, your games. That would be the great for the users as well. Mm -hmm. Next one. So okay. let's talk about the last part, is now that we got your, your, their players kind of hooked within the game, let's talk about how do you get them to come back mm -hmm. and keep coming back. All right, so uh, this is the, uh, the Comtas the Games, uh, which is the Korean game uh, developers in the Japan market. So they're doing, what they're doing is the, uh, they're doing the, the user support in the local languages in Japan. So, uh, which is the uh, user can comment whatever uh, about the games in the uh, user review, and the uh, comments get the, uh, this is a good chance to reply, the reply to the uh, user's comment and support the users, and then get more good retention from the users. So, uh, this is a pretty good example in Japan, and the, what the, the outside of the Japanese developers doing in the user support. And to know, Comptos is actually a developer. They're based in Korea. And so they actually do this for English as well. And so for a lot of developers coming in, talking to and speaking, responding to your user in their local language makes yeah. it that much better. And like they respond a lot better. And the user, user thinking about the, oh, this, these guys are supporting the local languages. And then, oh, OK, I, I can trust them. And then they play more in the games. That's the important things. And next one is the uh, a little tweak point is, but the uh, notification is an important thing as well. Uh, from the user perspective, uh, this is the uh, example though. Uh, the don't forget to localize the entire the notification in the notification bar. So uh, the sub subject is in the Japanese in this uh, example, but the the uh, the Still the, still the text is still in the English. And the user realizes, oh, this is the, uh, not localized perfectly in Japanese in the local language. So uh, this might be the uh, user uh, probably think about, OK, should I leave the games or should I stay in there? But the, uh, that's the point is the don't forget the everything's in localized in the notification as well. And this is true if you have like a content update, right? You've worked so hard to right. make all this new game mode or new content. And then if you finally push the users, but if they don't understand what you just pushed, then <laughs> it kind of defeats points. So, Something update, okay. okay. So, all right, let's talk about all purchase right. patterns. So, okay. so uh, this is the one tips for the entering the Japanese market and the Asian market. So uh, Dell is the, uh, we can see the many uh, monthly uh, revenue peak in once in a month. So uh, because- and why is that? Why? 
because the, we provide in a, uh, several of the formal payment method uh, for the Japanese users. One as a credit card, two as the gift card, I show you guys. And third is data Kelly Bling. And then Japanese users are allowed to use the data Kelly Bling. That's, the, that's making it once in a month uh, the peak revenues. And the uh, data calendar has the limitation of the users in the uh, in the uh, in the month. So, which is the everyone's spending the money in the month and then touch the limitations, then they cannot buy any more. So, when does it refresh? So, refresh timing is first of the month in Japan time. So, uh, the. So after refresh that limitation, the limitations, then uh, user immediately try to buy the contents. Then uh, the Japanese developers knows about that things. Then they making a special event for this target once of the month. So that's why user want to buy, and the developers providing the uh, good contents and the super layer contents in the months then making the uh, big revenues in the uh, Japanese market. That's a little bit the uh, tips for the Japanese market. And this is not in Japan as well. I mean, a lot of, a lot of other markets like Korea and, some of, uh, and even some markets in Southeast Asia, a lot of people don't have credit cards or mm -hmm. they don't tend to use credit cards to make purchases for digital items. And so they'll actually use their mobile phone or like so they use carrier billing or they use gift cards. So it's actually really good to understand like not only how a user plays, but actually how they actually per do purchases online because they'll help you better kind of position a lot of your items and a lot of your moniz monetization mechanics. Yeah. Especially within within a game or an app. All right. So next thing is is like not only um, is it important to kind of understand purchase patterns, but it's also understand what types of holidays or seasonal content you can do to bring players back. And so Valentine's Day is clearly some a holiday that's celebrated almost everywhere in the world. And so creating unique co content based on that is a great way to kind of get users into game. This is an example of Badland. They've made special levels to kind of include more kind of the Valentine's Day content. And so it's a good way to kind of delight your users coming in. But then we can even talk about super local stuff. So yeah. let's talk about in Japan. In Japan, so uh, the back to the school season in the U.S. is the September, right? Yep. So, Late August and September. Yeah. yeah. That's the, uh, everyone's making a campaign in their games or in the applications in the U.S. market. But back to the ages, uh, the back to the school, the campaign is the actual is the April, happened in April. So uh, everyone's making the games or campaigns on the, the end of the March through to the April. That's the different things in the local market. And also, the, uh, I would like to mention about the long holiday stuff. And the, in Asia, for example, this is the bottom one is the uh, Golden Week campaign in Japan, which is the long, long uh, spring break in May in Japan, and as well as a cold year. And the, that thing is the uh, long vacation is uh, specific for the Japan and Korean market. Then we making the campaign, the developers making a campaign. That's the uh, different things in the other side of the Western market. I mean, being aware of these seasons um, is actually very important by region. I mean, I was just in Brazil, and you know, if you push out, and it's actually technically winter there because it's in the southern hemisphere, right? So if you actually push out a summer-themed content, like with beach volleyballs mm -hmm. and all that stuff, it's not going to make sense because it's actually like in the 50s and raining and dark. So summer you campaign, summer in campaign winter. in winter. Yeah, let's. That's probably not going to make too much sense. So it's actually, it's very important to kind of be aware of that, no matter, especially understanding where your users are and like um, around the world, make sure if you're going to push out seasonal content that it's definitely relevant for that region. Mm -hmm. All right. So our uh, next step is, so uh, I talk to the users, I talk to the another users of the game, it to, into the game is uh, collaboration with the well-known IP blind. So uh, this is an example of the Japanese games, Puzzle and Dragons. So they try to make in the uh, try to acquire the new users to use the uh, the famous well-known IP collaborations. Light side is the uh, they collaborate with the Dragon Ball, and then 
user can actually play the Dragon Balls uh, characters in a game. That's they make the uh, many users, many new users coming back to the Puzzle and Dragons. And left side is uh, Android Robot. They collaborate with the Android Robot as well, and then making uh, some uh, campaigns and then special dungeon in there. And hopefully, the, get uh, more users. We can, we can get the they can get the more users in there. So collaborate with the IP, the well known IP license stuff is pretty uh, good way to acquire the new users in Japan market and the Korean market as well. So that IP actually doesn't only have to be fictional, they can actually be real life as well. And so in Korea, you have a great lot. In Korea, it's, there's a really big like celebrity K-pop culture. Um, actually, Nexon has decided to do a special campaign with one of the very popular K-pop girls band called Girls Day. And they decided to build kind of like their almost um, in-game, like they build an in-game version, in-game character version of all the Girls Day characters for their one of their um, MMORPG games. And so it's it's actually pretty interesting. It's just like kind of getting more users in, understanding that um, a lot of the users in that region really enjoy K-pop. They really kind of follow and um, follow like a lot of those uh, celebrities. And so having them be able to kind of purchase and ev or get a chance to even get some of these characters in their game or their arsenal is very, very attractive to a lot of these users as well. Mm -hmm. So it actually doesn't stop here. Um, we've only talked about like one this this a whole thing about acquiring, um, engaging, and retaining a player. It's only like a single player, right? So we can, we're going to talk about like what happens when you get a lot of those players coming in at once. And so you get some very interesting trends um, and new gameplay mechanics that emerge. Once not only you get more powerful devices and really reliable networks, but then you have tons and tons of like players that are playing games or interacting with applications. So let's take a look at what's happening in Japan. All right. So uh, those two titles is getting pretty popular in the Japan market. And the, uh, what are they doing is the, the, uh, the location-based API plus the real-time uh, match players. Real-time match player is uh, getting popular in the, the global way. But the, uh, that, those two titles is that you can play with the real friends, close friends, and then you can choose, uh, the one title is you can choose the close friends or the network friends, and the one title is only for uh, playing together with the new friends only. But the, playing with the new friend is, with the real time match player is getting popular right now. And also uh, the right side of Swingshot Blades uh, by Color Blue, and they are doing the sandbox in there on the second floors, and then you can ask the uh, corpus uh, what are they uh, doing in the games. And then you can play the big screens games right now in a sandbox. So then when devices get more powerful, this is kind of what happens. Yeah, uh, as I explained, the uh, Japanese games is uh, pretty casual games and then casual games combined but there is getting uh, more and more uh, hardcore games is getting popular as well. Uh, this, is the, this is not the PC online game. This is, on, uh, this is the game for the Android and the, uh, provided by the Asobimo, uh, name is the Zanagi Online, and they're using the Unreal engines. And then those kind of the uh, match player uh, hardcore game is getting popular in the Asia uh, not only Japan, not only the Korea, in some uh, the Asian market as well. But as like mobile gamer, um, as the audience kind of expands, especially when we have so like one billion plus devices out there, it actually kind of gives you more opportunities for different game genres to come and come up. And so, I mean, for some reason, like I mean, a lot of these story, a lot of these games, like you'll see High School Story, and this is episode um, um, that are kind of reinventing this genre that's called slice of life and the kind of the drama genre in games. Um, if you can remember, like dating sims are actually a very popular PC game genre in Asia, but they haven't really kind of gain a lot of traction in the US with the exception of The Sims. Mm -hmm. But you don't actually see a lot of that in mobile games. And so if you think about like how like, I mean, almost half of our audience is female, but then, you know, a lot of these people are gonna enjoy like these different types of game genres. So it's really interesting to see what new types of genres and applications there are outside of the traditional, I would say, action RPG and a lot of that hardcore elements that are kind of arising through these in the market right now. 
Um, and what's also interesting is that because it's not just one player, it's about many players coming together and building communities around their games, you see really interesting, I would say, not just gameplay, but interactions that are occurring within the game. Uh, Quiz Up, which is the game on the yeah. left, they actually have a discussion forum for all of their players um, that are happening online. And all these players actually come in and use, talk about like all the different topics about the quiz topics, and they actually kind of make... Um, talk about like let's say physics or like let's just say their favorite TV shows and all that stuff. And so it's very interesting to see the types of engagement that happens just by having a discussion forum or a chat, real time chat feature mm. within the game. And then if you look at high school story, they actually allow you to connect with all of those in game characters with your real life friends. And so it actually brings this extra kind of personal touch. I mean imagine like reimagining the high school life that you wanted to lead um, but then you can put in all of your old high school friends or some of the other friends too. So it's, it's a lot of fun, a lot of like, you know, small touches that we're seeing.